Sunday stories. As you're all joining this morning, I will just um, run through a little bit of history about the Saturday Stories program. Uh, this was an in-person um, Saturday Stories workshop with a reading and a presentation of how our author, author illustrators have uh, created their picture books. This started at the Society of Illustrators in Manhattan. So very easy for people who are in the city, local or in the area to, to reach us. But we are a small museum and we could only really host about 30 participants um, for this type of a workshop. And this was a family workshop where children would come with an adult, uh, either a parent, family member, grandparents, or anyone that would bring them along to show them the museum and do a wonderful workshop, meet an illustrator and get a picture book at the time signed, which is still now um, a different program that we run at the Society called Saturday uh, Picture Book Spotlight. So look out for that. We have some uh, running this fall. And during the pandemic, we turned obviously all to the digital world and we created children's programs online for, for a family program of virtual Saturday stories. So in 2020 fall, we started this program and we've had very generous sponsors who have uh, helped us to create this program and bring it to you all for free. So it's free to register. It's on the third Saturday of every month. Look out for super world known illustrators, award winning, very acclaimed and prolific illustrators as well as brand new illustrators. And this morning, I'm absolutely delighted to have Michael Garland, who is one of those superstar picture book author illustrators and illustrator of other people's books written by other authors. Um, let me tell you, he has done more than 44 books himself that he's authored and illustrated, starting at around 1992 with his first author illustrated book. And then he's also done more than 50 collaborations with other writers. And I urge you to go to his website, which is linked on our um, page where you found this Zoom um, workshop and or check him out. And Tim, behind the scenes at the Society of Illustrators will write in the chat, his um, website address. And you can follow him also on Instagram at Michael Garland Arts and check out all his amazing books. So the book that we're featuring this morning is called We're Not Weird. And it's a structure and function in the animal kingdom of some really intriguing animals. One of them that I've always found rather fun is the blue-footed booby. You may have heard of this uh, crazy bird with bright blue feet. Well, blue is my favorite color, so those feet are really magical to me. <laughs> with many other animals, um, there's a glossary in the back, and you can check out more details and how to pronounce the names of these animals, where they're found in the world. And, and Michael has done this book in his style of woodcut and digital, which he's going to explain during our program this morning, so you can find out how he did this. It's a really beautiful technique. Michael works in many different styles. This is something we were discussing together, how exciting it is for him and for us as um, you know, readers of his books, all the different styles that he uh, marries with the different books because each story might need a different style of illustration. Some are more um, cartoon style, whimsical, um, some are more arts, uh, fine art style. And you'll get to see more and more of these books um, throughout the presentation because Mike is going to touch on those. Um, he's always working on more books and he also has a fine art gallery of um, work that he does. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out too. Uh, Michael was born in Manhattan. So he is local to the Society of Illustrators as um, his heritage there and um, went to school at one of the most uh, prestigious art schools in Manhattan. We have several, but Pratt Institute is up there as one of the best, right? In Brooklyn, though, in Brooklyn. Oh, yeah, in Brooklyn. Sorry, I'm calling New York, but yes, it's in the in the um, borough of Brooklyn. And um, he now lives in Patterson in New York with his wife. And he has, I believe, three children, is it? Yes. Two daughters and one son, yes, who have been featured in his books. So in earlier books, when they were younger children, he used them as models, which is something that I also urge you to think about is when you're creating drawings, just look around you, use family members or pets as your models. That's really a great um, idea to do that. And I, I should think family members love to see themselves in the books. Um, so this morning, we're going to learn more about how Michael did this book. He's going to read the book to you. 
Um, obviously, this book can be found uh, where books are sold or in your local library. Do check it out. And Michael's done other books in the nonfiction series. But as I said, he's got a variety of books. So you can check out books on all kinds of things. Um, there's ones on Santa Claus that you did that was really magical. Um, tugboats and a lost dog. I, I mean, just so many names of books are popping into my head, but do check them out on his website. I'm sure a lot of you are fans and already know and are familiar with Michael's work. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over the presentation now to Michael, but do ask questions. Michael loves to have questions and we won't just wait until the workshop part, which usually I do the questions um, at that last part of the um, presentation this morning. But you can ask questions during because something might come to mind and um, just write it in the chat or in the Q&A and I will just um, pass on the question to Michael as he's uh, speaking to you about his work. So don't be shy. Ask lots of questions. Do tell us where you're joining from. We'd love to know where you're joining from because being virtual, you can join from all over the world. We'd love to hear where you're coming in from. And um, do send in any of your drawings. As you can see behind Michael this morning, there is a super deer head that he's going to discuss a bit more and he's going to show you how he would go about drawing that and you can draw along and we'd love to see your drawings so do send them to my email i'll pass that along to michael or you can share on his instagram and um so over to you michael thank you for joining hey. us this morning thank you now we'll share the screen i guess uh and now that deer head i want to make it clear that i'm not a hunter i didn't shoot that deer i uh, inherited that uh mounted deer head from my, my wife Peggy, uh, from her uncle Bob. It's about eighty or ninety years old. I think so I couldn't bear to shoot an animal. So, but I do. <laughs> we live in the country, and we have deer coming right up to the on uh, the edge of um, my house. Many times, I just look out my studio window to watch deer eating our flowers. So, I guess oh, now yes. we go, now is we'll go to the uh, easy way for him to be a model is yes. um, in this way rather than you trying to chase down a deer outside. Yes. <laughs> Anyone? Yes, please, please share your presentation. Fantastic. Okay, we'll hit the share of the screen. Okay. 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 So let's see here. All right. Now, as I said, I've done every kind of um, book you can imagine. I've done it in, in my whole illustration career. I've done every kind of illustration you can imagine. But the thing I really love doing most is writing and illustrating children's books. And it started, as we mentioned, in uh, my first three books were My Cousin Katie, this down here in the, this corner, um, uh, a Circus Girl, where that's hiding someplace, and um, a Dinner at Magritte's um, uh, down here. And um, the, each one of those books had my one of our children as uh, the main character. My Cousin Katie is about a little girl who lives on a farm. Uh, uh, circus Girl is about a, a little girl who lives with the circus. And um, Dinner at Magritte's is about a, a, a little boy who lives next door to Rene Magritte. And they invite him over for dinner and Salvador Dali comes to visit. But I, I, uh, out of all the things I've done in illustration, I really realized that illustrating my own text was the most satisfying thing and inspiring thing. So I've I've had 44 books published as author and illustrator, and I've done, I, I've lost count, probably another 50 books for other authors by now. And um, that's the thing I enjoy most out of the, my whole career. And, and, um, uh, and I keep doing it for, for every one book, and people, aspiring authors should know this, for every one book I get published, I write about um, three or four that never make it, that are valid, but there's just not enough room in the world for that many books by me and um i always uh think some of the books in the past should be uh maybe i'll get a chance to publish them in the future but now here here is the um here are some of the other books they not i couldn't fit all in on here but um these are some of the books that i've i've uh, illustrated for other authors and i've done a few uh um pretty well-known authors uh, michael Keane and uh, james patterson and I've done two for Gloria Stefan. And it's fun. When I um, illustrated a book for James Patterson, it was a Christmas book, and it became the window. Here it is up in the upper right-hand corner here, uh, Santa Kid. It became the window of Saks Fifth Avenue, a Christmas window. So that was pretty neat to see my illustrations turned into the Christmas window and millions of people walking by. That's a lot of fun. And, um, and I just illustrated a book for the... the um, 
the Getty Museum called uh, The Traveling Camera, uh, Lewis Hind and, uh, and the Fight to End Child Labor by Alexandra Hendricks. Uh, um, and it just won the Wisconsin uh, Picture Book, Outstanding Picture Book Award. So that's yeah. fun to do. It's, it's, it's really gratifying. And as you can see, I work in a wide variety of techniques. Some of them are very are realistic, nonfiction, um, and other ones are just fun, silly drawings. So I, I enjoy doing both things, and but it gives me more range to do uh, to do picture uh, picture books. But I'm kind of an outside nature boy myself. I'm definitely not a wildlife expert. I, I research everything I've done, and um, and it's fun. I enjoy doing the research, and I have to then take what sometimes is complicated and distill it down into text that a child can understand. And But this is something that always interested me, uh, the strange looking animals. And they're not just strange for, there's a reason there, their structure and, uh, and function that, that, that allows them to survive in nature. So they're not just strange looking for, for, for novelty's sake, they are really, uh, it's important. They're, the way they look has, uh, takes, uh, is an important part, a tool for their survival. So now the interesting thing I've done on both uh, uh, Birds Make Nests is a book that also, it's a nature book uh, about different kinds of birds and their and the structure of their nest. Um, I, I decided to try a new technique where I would carve into a block of wood uh, an image. And um, I don't know how well you can see this, but, um, and then that would be the basis you really uh, I don't know how well we can see that. That would be the basis for uh, the, the beginning of the illustration. I, so it's a combination of the oldest technique. Woodblock printing is the one of the oldest techniques uh, in, in illustration. The first books were, were illustrated with woodblock prints. Uh, but, and I combine it with the newest, the digital age. So, so, the, so I'll, I'll carve an image into that block. And I originally, I started to pull prints from it. And I, I thought they were so inconsistent. Then I then I photographed the actual wood block and and scanned that in. So that that serves as the initial, um, and then then I continue to work over and put more detail once I work digitally because sometimes it be especially in this book the um, the the crude cutting wasn't enough. So I had to enhance it digitally as I as I do it. So first I start out with the black print. And then uh, in the layers in Photoshop, I add the color and separate each one of these uh, characters. As you can see on the screen there, the blue-footed booby and the, um, the hawk nose, uh, humming, the hummingbird uh, hawk moth. Uh, I can move those around. And if you're working, I used to work traditionally with oil paints and watercolors, and you don't have the, if the, if the art director said, can you move that uh, hummingbird hawk moth down a little bit? It's you'd have to start all over again. And my friends who still work traditionally know exactly. And that happens all the time in, in publishing that they have a neat design for the book. And uh, you and that's what you'd have to do. So at least digitally, you have that luxury to do that in publishing as an author. That's why I've done so many. You have to make yourself user friendly. Otherwise, uh, um, otherwise, no one wants to work with you if, you, if you're kind of, uh, um, you know, a, you think you're a genius that nobody can. Uh, offer any advice for your work, then you'll won't be able to survive in the in the. So doing this technique allows me to, and it allows me to be more creative. Sometimes I'll my original sketch that I'll realize as I'm working on it that uh, I want to move something around, and since it's on separate layers, I it can I can make it larger or smaller or lighten it or darken it as I go, and it gives me a big a more creative a, a creative advantage if you if you think of yourself if, if you were writing a story and you had to write it out in a fountain pen and neatness counted uh compare that to working on a computer in a word process where you can change the text and uh and alter it and make new versions of it and edit it yourself uh it's much more uh fluid and, and you and you can make changes on on the on the run and you're not married to doing the whole piece over again so well, Michael, I just have a little um, question actually coming in, sure. so I just want to share that with you. So T. Thomas Selig has written in from Olympia, Washington, so coming in from the West Coast, um, and he says, I love the facial expressions on the day Santa got lost, so he ah. just wanted to mention that, and yes. I will say so thank you very much for that question, and do think of any more, and I'm sure Michael can answer as okay. many as you can. 
<laughs> well, thank, thank you very, very much for that. Uh, and that's an important thing. I try some of my favorite illustrators like Norman Rockwell and N.C. Wyatt. That was their big selling thing. And Maurice Sendak and, and all the great illustrators. You have to really be to draw people. And some in the past, I used to use models and work like Norman Rockwell and set it up. But now for my picture books, I just draw out of my imagination. And it's much uh, more uh, liberating really. Uh, uh, and so I'll do, when I start a picture book, I'll, I work, I have sketches. I don't know if you can see this, but this whole book is is sketchbooks uh, or drawings from a picture book from different picture yes. books that, I, that, I drew, that I've worked on. And actually this is probably all from one picture book. And that's the way it starts out. And I just give myself over to that process of, of drawing and drawing and every book. I, I could do a whole picture book, a whole pad for one picture book of different drawings, and then I can posit them together for uh, and edit them to to make the final pictures. And then then uh, only then do I begin to do the color. That's the last thing I do on them. So these are different kinds of animals. These are these are um, just they have unusual things. And it's in the book it talks about a platypus and a great trove frog and the barbarossa. These are all animals that have unusual uh, physical char characteristics. Uh, this, this is the uh, uh, Ziaga um, antelope, and they have a very unusual nose. When I saw that, I thought, wow, that's great. I'd love to draw that. And that. But that nose is just not a cartoon affectation. That really helps them breathe. They're a herd animal, and it filters out all the dust when they're, uh, when they're and it regulates their temperature. So again, I did this all through research. I am not... Um, uh, I'm not a, an animal expert. This is the longhorn orb weaver spider and the atola jellyfish. And these are just kind of neat animals. And uh, you can see, you can almost guess why they uh, have the, why the, long, the longhorn orb weaver spider, what his, what the function of those horns are. It helps him uh, uh, weave his nest. And the atola jellyfish, those long tentacles, they capture fish and that's how they feed themselves. So, and they're just beautiful animals. Uh, and this is the mud skipper. I, 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 I thought it was neat. Whoops. Um, I thought it was neat that, um, uh, that the mud skipper, uh, he can get, climb out of the water. It breathes through his skin and, and um, uh, that helps it go from one tidal pond to the next to feed himself. So it's kind of neat. I thought, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> He he's got a uh, you can you our, our little screen insert is blocking, but he has a little crab in his mouth, so that's what he's eating. He's he's gone from one tidal pool to the next. So I just thought that was neat. I never realized, you know, I I heard about this in the past, but as a child, it would just have astounded me to think that a fish could walk out of the water. You know, does he change color underwater? Um, I don't. Um, no, that's the blobfish. Oh, that's the blobfish. That's, that's the blobfish. Right. That fish chain, we'll get to that later, but that yes. fish changes color. I mean, it changes color and, and the size of it changes. One, yeah, fascinating. Now this is a, a gharial uh, and it has a very long snout, which again is covered up by a little insert here, but it's it looks like a, a alligator or a crocodile, but that long snout helps it uh, capture fish. Each one of these unusual things um, are uh, to, help them survive and and that that his long snout is uh, a tool to uh to uh catch fish now here's the star nose mole um that that uh, i have these in my backyard <laughs> and and, and, oh, really? and uh, whoops uh there's the platypus the uh and it, it's unusual they look almost like a, um they have a, a bill like a duck and they lay eggs but they're they're not they're a mammal they're not a fish so, I mean, uh, not a, a bird. So, but it is, it is kind of neat. The star nose mole, that unusual uh, structure on the end of his, uh, his nose, that helps him feel around. It's electrosensitive and it helps him feel around under the uh, ground to find uh, prey, again, worms and grubs. This is a maned wolf. Uh, whoops. This is a maned wolf and uh, it looks like a fox or a wolf, but uh, it's not. It's a, a um, it's uh, it, it uses its long legs to catch prey. Um, uh, and you can see it chasing that uh, little rabbit. <laughs> and uh, this is the uh, this is the blobfish. This is the fish we were just talking about. Where uh, this is what it looks like on the left in great depths. Uh, 
it, it'll be darker green and it just it floats in the, with this very high pressure on the deeper you go and uh its physical structure just helps it to float on the bottom and the prey comes to it but occasionally it'll be captured in a fisherman's net and brought to the top and that change of uh pressure which is really great it it, it bloats up its flesh and that's and, and changes its color so it's pretty neat i when i saw that i was amazed yeah and this is the hummingbird hawk moth, which uh, I showed you the uh, plate I did for that, the black and white plate. You couldn't see that very well on the screen, but but um, uh, this this we have these around here too, and uh, they are. It looks people think they're um, people think they're um, actually uh, moths, uh, or they think they're hummingbirds, but they're actually it's a hawk moth. So uh, this is the narwhal whale. And um, people think they used to call them uh, the uh, um, the unicorns of the sea. unicorns of the sea. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, and and this is the uh, pangolin. And this is unfortunate that um, they're kind of on the endangered list because people are collecting them for pride for to stuff them in and for, keep them as pets. And they're they're a threatened species, but the kind of neat thing about them that that their skin is like their outer layer is like armor and um when something is threatening threatening them uh, to eat them or or uh, they roll up in a ball and it makes them kind of impenetrable for an animal they really have trouble breaking through their armor so that's that that's that uh outer layer is not just for a decoration it serves a real purpose it's like armor to protect them so yeah. uh now uh, this is the uh, uh, sundra flying lemur, and um, I love that the image is great. Yes, it's very unusual that it goes from the uh, the skin has long skin. It's kind of like a bat almost, and uh, it flies from tree to tree, and uh, and uh, it's, it's it's to protect itself from predators. That that structure gives it makes it much more mobile, and they can fly high up in birds and things. They they uh, animals on the ground can't get them, and they can uh, flee from birds, bird predators. So um, it's a it's a fun thing, and it's, these are animals that just captured my attention. Uh, this is the okapi, and it's uh, it looks like a zebra or a deer, uh, but it's kind of a combination of both things, and it's it's unusual. Um, uh, it's 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 pattern on it is for uh, to camouflage itself in the bush and hide from predators. You can see uh, over on the right that's a cheetah there. And um, that would be their camouflage would uh, hide them from uh, prey. And this is the uh, thorny dragon. This you would see this in the desert, and it, it, you can really understand just by looking at it. All those spikes. If you were a bird or or some si a coyote or something, and you were thinking about eating this, you would think twice <laughs> because biting into it would be a painful experience. So that's what. That's how this animal evolved and, and stayed in, you know, thriving today. Yeah, it almost looks like teeth along its Yes, yeah. yeah. You can't, you wouldn't even want to pick that up, let alone Michael, eat. did you um, get to see any of these creatures at uh, various zoos or anything? Um, oh, yes, I did go to some zoos and uh, I saw, we, we were out, um, uh, out in the um, desert at Bryce Canyon and they have, uh, desert tortoises out there and uh yeah. but mo most of the most of the research i i did by gathering photographs online and uh right and it's really fun them... research isn't it i'm sure you were just so engrossed in all of that research i, yeah, I mean i, I do that anyway locally locally i do that some of the animals like the gray uh tree frog we have them right in our yard and the the, the star nose mole we have right in our yard and that's just when I see them, uh, uh, those right there in your own yard, yeah, these the, unusual. The, the gray tree frog, they can. One of them hopped up on our on our deck on the railing, and it changed color. It blended right in with the color of the house. And then sometimes I'll see them in the woods, and they'll be green, greenish gray, and uh, so it's kind of amazing how they can change. And that's mm -hmm. something right outside the door. That was my idea with birds make nests. Uh, that the, the, there could be a, and right outside my window of my studio, I can point five feet away and there are birds nests that I can see, just look out my window. And it's kind of an amazing thing 
and there and many places they're there and people just don't notice them so that was that's my kind of to inspire that uh that to make to inspire kids to to want to look at look for a bird's nest i'll look in the birds and see what color the eggs are and where the and sometimes there's a hole in the tree and then so that's my job and i think if i can if i'm interested in it i can create a book that children will be interested in so that's my philosophy going forward there's the Dead desert corridors that was they were out in uh rice canyon i think they're in, in danger they don't want you touching them or anything but you can see them out there and they have big sculptures of them in the park. So, uh, um, I, 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 we're already having a lot of appreciation for you sharing this because the illustrations have been appreciated. They're saying how wonderful they are. And yes, it, is, it is exciting to sort of walk through them with you and hear how you, you know, thought about the animals, were interested yourself about the animals. And thanks to you creating this book and for Holiday House publishing it. We can all enjoy this book. So I already have my own copy, which yes. someday I'll have Michael sign for me when I see it. <laughs> you can get it in a bookstore near you. <laughs> get it in, yes. And especially yeah. your local bookstores. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now I have some more. Uh, I have this is the Barbarossa, and they have a very unusual look to them. They, um, uh, they, they battle with rivals. They stand on their hind legs and two males will fight over a female. And they have a very unusual looking uh, tusk. But they don't use them for fighting. They they and when they fight, they stand on their hind legs. But they're just a really strange looking animal when you see them, uh, pictures of them. So that intrigued me. So I wanted to include them in the book. And this is the gray tree frog. You can find I just mentioned that you can find this right outside uh, right outside my door. If you step out my back door or the front door, you can see them. Sometimes I see them on our steps, <laughs> you know. And in the springtime, they you hear them um, like they generate with their peeps, they make a huge noise. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's kind of fun to, to uh, see all that. And these are just, these are, are kind of summing up at the end of the book there, um, there, these are all the animals and they're just, uh, it's a, whoops, a, a collection on them. And uh, it's just, you can see them all together and they look to our eye, they look strange, but they're not strange. There's a reason for their structure. So. And it's just yeah. fun to draw. Like when I when I do a picture book, I want to do something. I want to write something that I would love to draw, and th that um, that is what always inspires me. And, uh, oh, and I, a very good tip. Yeah, very good tip for you yeah. know aspiring illustrators: draw what right. you love to draw. As a, it's the drawing is the actual easy part for me. To, uh, ch uh, children always when I I do school visits all over the country. You can contact me if you want me to want to book dates for that but but um kids ask the same questions all the time how did you know you wanted to be an illustrator or an artist and um that uh i i just knew right from the start I, no one ever told me my parents gave me when i was a toddler crayons and paper and i would just draw and i just taught myself how to draw bugs bunny just be no one told me i had to do that but i i I just taught myself how to draw Bugs Bunny. And when we went to uh, elementary school, the, uh, th my first day of kindergarten, when they passed out the pencil, the paper and crayons, I drew Bugs Bunny just because I could. And um, <laughs> the teacher the teacher held up my drawing and showed the whole class, oh, look what Michael Garland did. And I always say they never, no teacher has el ever held up my math test to show how wonderful <laughs> I am. So, I, after a while, with that possible, I knew I was on the right track of drawing. You're on the right track, for nobody, sure, Michael, for sure. No, nobody ever <laughs> held up my math test. So, and, and that just continued, even though some of the schools, they only had uh, my elementary school and high school had barely any art at all. But that was my one day to shine when there was art day at, at my elementary school or the rare time it was at my high school. And uh, but then from then on, I went to college and just pursued it because I knew it was the one thing in the world I can do well. And uh, well, nothing, I'm OK at everything else, but this is the one thing I do well. So. You do very well. And you can write, too. So. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that, and that was very satisfying, too. And I owe that to all my elementary school teachers. I have a book that was pretty well received all over the country called A Miss Smith and the Incredible Storybook. And it's about reading. Miss Smith has this storybook that has all the stories in the world in it. And um, 
that's right. It, everybody, I, I dedicated that book to my teachers that I had in elementary and high school because they were the ones who taught me to love reading. I still, I'm always, my parents were always reading a book. I'm, I always have a book I'm, I'm working on uh, reading at, at the time. My children are readers. So, and my, so that's, the, and then to write something, I don't always, it's satisfying to write, even though, like I say, one out of four gets published if I'm lucky. And, uh, but it's satisfying the doing of it, it's satisfying. So, yeah. Now I have more pictures. This is Birds Make Nest. I, I wanted to show more of my wildlife uh, that complemented that led up to this book. So we'll go through these. But Birds Make Nest, this is the first one I did. I used that same woodcut te technique. And this got quite, this one about foreign national awards, this outstanding science trade book. Um, it won the Maine State Reading Award. Uh, the, um, the uh, Bank Street Outstanding uh, Picture Book Award and the, the uh, Mazda Museum uh, Caldecott Selection Committee voted this their selection. So I knew I was onto something and it's satisfying when you just love doing something that I uh, like these, these are peleated woodpeckers that yeah. they, I could see them right outside my window. And it just, when I see them, it just made me want to draw them. So I did a whole book and uh, these are some of the pictures from it. I, and I did in, in that woodcut, the same it's woodcut stunning, technique. Um, art style. It's just gorgeous, gorgeous. And I love working. And, and then I can just switch gears and work on some other silly cartoony book that I've liked. And I enjoy that just as much. Yeah. But uh, these, again, these are a lot of these you can see right outside my uh, window. But it's, it's written. Uh, it's <laughs> Often they're very simple text and in a, in a way a child and they have just different birds have different style nests and um, now this is a new project I just worked on uh, with Jessica uh, Stremer she's the author it's about how animals and this is also all those three all these books are from Holiday House they they were the ones who allowed me to do this kind of nature nonfiction <clears throat> and this is just the actual book is not out yet but this is what the cover is going to look like and it's about how different animals um react during uh, 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 fires, how that's called fire escape. And this is how they escape uh, during fires and how they react to fires. So it's fun. Now this is in very much the same kind of technique, but I didn't actually use any wood at all in these. Uh, I, it's all digital. It's almost like a digital scratch board technique because sometimes the when I'm doing with the woodcut, you can only do so fine. The line can only go so fine, but sometimes I need, I had to, continue to enhance that wood block once it gets into the computer and this one I, I needed such fine uh it wasn't there was no point in doing it as wood block so uh but it's a fun that's they they the uh the editor love the the kind of wood engraving style and this is what it looks looks like when I start it's, this is the first step I do a black and white and it's almost like scratch board which I can do but but I but I do it digitally it's the same reductive technique I start with a black shape and carve out of that the light and uh but with digitally uh, digital I can move one of these birds if it turns out the type design gets larger or smaller that's the beauty I can move this bird down here a little bit if you do actual scratch board or woodcut it's it's much different more difficult you have to really do it over to move one of the elements but they're fun to do again this looks very much like the deer over my shoulder there <laughs> yes it does um T, T Thomas has a quick question for you sure. uh, Mike um, do you find that nature nonfiction has more demands to get published in today's markets? Um, um, well, it, there, it's it's good for school and library sales. You're not likely to see it on the bestseller list if you look like something like Dragons Love Tacos has been on there for six years. And they tend to be books like that that ha would have um, just more fun, silly appeal, which uh, I do also. But um, I just really love, this is a case where probably you're not likely to see it on the bestsellers because of the nature. It's more schools and libraries and, and people who ha are, are interested themselves in nature might buy it for their children or grandchildren. But um, the books on the bestsellers tend to be more just silly fiction and fun, you know, that anybody can buy into. So right. you're less likely to see that on the bestseller list. But I just want to give you a wee time check, um, Michael. It's um, six minutes past 11. Okay. So we can see more of this presentation and a, a quick reading. And then okay, yes. Okay.
Uh, there's the black and white of the deer. And this is a fox fleeing, and that and you can see in the above the above um, the back. I'm not having the image change. Is everybody else having the? Oh, there we go. There we go. Perfect. Can you Makes see that? Okay. Perfect. Uh, that that's the uh, a fox, and uh, they're spraying fire retardant chemicals on the fire behind it. Yeah, fascinating. That's what it looks like in black and white. Now, in years past, this would have been the just the illustration. Um, would look like this because most books when they had interior illustrations um they would be black and white they just couldn't afford color early on it's only in recent years that that's been something that a book like this would have color illustrations inside it but you really add a lot to it and this is um uh an iguana um or a, a lizard fleeing uh fleeing from the fire and these are cattle in a field and what they they would smell the fire first so this is fun to do. I mean, I'm having fun when I do this, uh, that I enjoy. I, I love looking. I'm a very, I, uh, as far as an illustrator, I'm a very eclectic uh, artist that I like everything from very old engravings to new contemporary things. So um, I just have an open mind. And I, and I know some artists work in only one style and they'll only work. And that's just as legitimate. But I, li I find it too creatively inhibiting. I like to do different, different styles for uh, different things. Wow, so you've done so many books, it shows. Yes, yes. well, that, through my whole career, not just in picture books, just in general, that mm -hmm. I've done everything you can imagine and being versatile uh, um, allowed me to make a living. I mean, that was my whole goal. It was slow getting started as an artist uh, in the field. Uh, so I, if you called me up to do a job, I said, yes, I could do it. <laughs> and that's how I stay, that's how I pay the rent. And you get experience that way. It's yes, you do. It, it, it's a, it builds a whole body of experience. And it's just as legitimate. I have friends that worked in the exact same style uh, since they started in the business. And they've had wonderful careers. And uh, But I just found that too creatively inhibiting for myself and just economically to, you know, when, when some art director, this happens in the business, some art director you love would they retire or get fired or transferred. And that th then you're out of luck that, that the new... The new guy that comes the business, yeah. Wants to use somebody new. That's a, here's a raccoon, and oh, that's cute. And we we have these all around here. I can look out uh, my window of my studio and see raccoons trying to break into our garbage cans. So in but, garbage, exactly. <laughs> they use their little hands. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the kind of neat thing. They look very uh, human when they do that. And this is a a, a, a beetle and. Uh, um they how they burrow out of the trees or into the trees this is a woodpecker and uh in some ways fires it sounds terrible in some ways uh fire forest fires can be renewing they burn away the old growth it's part of the natural cycle but in places exactly where i, I live where it would be a disaster because we've moved into the area and um it, everybody's houses are right i walk out my door i'm in the middle of thick woods so forest fire now this is this is a chipmunk which we have in droves around here they go into a state of atrophy when they, they burrow into the ground and just kind of go into a hibernation state mm. and oh, this is more from the from birds make nest and again this is oh and here's a here's kind of a middle ground uh fish had a wish it was a nature book we have a, a something called the great swamp around here and we go kayaking and canoeing in it, and i got the idea for fish so this is kind of in the middle of the the uh in between fiction and non-fiction this is a, a fish who gets bored with being a fish so it's really it's really fiction fish don't get bored with being fish and but but i use kind of a japanese woodcut style and this this is where it began this this technique Okay, oh, there we go. So, uh, okay, so shall I read now? I from from uh, that's the that end. Would be, that would be lovely. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and uh, I'll just I guess we'll I guess we'll close out of this um, this. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, you were screen stop share. Okay, okay, so I'll just yeah. so. Oh, but but first, before I start reading, I'd like to show some of the other. Uh, I have books. Some of the other picture books. That I've done for Holiday House that are the opposite. They're they're silly. Uh, this yeah, is Lost so Dog. Cool. And this is, well, this is a nonfiction ferry boat. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is Car Goes Far. And there's a wide range of techniques. Here's here's Fish Had a Wish. 
Oh, this, this is a book I did. Here's a nonfiction book that I did in the same style uh, by Michelle Lord about, about animals and what different classes they are. And oh, and this is kind of a neat thing. This is birds what? make nests in the Chinese edition. And that's a wonderful thing. That, yeah, yeah. That, that yeah, all over the translated world. Translated into lots of languages, aren't they? <laughs> I just really love that. One, a bonus I never considered that uh, some little child on the other side in China or Korea or Japan or South America or uh, in France, they've all had different uh, translations of my books. And I just really love that idea. Some story that I wrote right here, right at this table uh, in this studio and pictures I did in the studio, there's a little kid reading it on the other side of the world. And that's yeah. a, an unbelievable bonus. That's now, I also do, here, here a, here's a painting that I do, I do wildlife paintings. And this is an oil painting of, of owls, uh, barn yeah. owls. And uh, so when I get a chance, these are something that nobody puts a gun to my head as I draw that. I just- I <laughs> You do it for your own pleasure, yeah. I do it for my, and, I, and I'll sell these in galleries and put them in shows or not sell them, depending. The, the, gallery, the gallery world is a whole separate world. And and uh, here's a, a surrealistic, I did a whole series of surrealistic uh, um, portraits like this. And that's really just, jumping into a new look. Yeah, different look. I mean, yeah. you can see that um, I also have a fine art website, um, michaelgarlandfineart.com, where you can see the work I'm currently doing. Yes, and, absolutely. And yes. It, it all goes back into my illustration of different it's terms. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. I, I can't recommend it enough. And in fact, uh, T. Thomas has just written, You're amazing, running out to get this book right away. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. um, do you, now we have time to do a little drawing? Yes, let's see you do some drawing, Michael. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Okay, so let me see if I can get this in here. Um, now, I'm going to, I'm using a charcoal pencil. So I'll see if, how this, how this reads. And this would be a simple, a simple drawing. I only have a few minutes, so. Can you see it? Okay. Um, I don't know if you could pull your chair just a wee fraction bit to the side. I know that makes it difficult for you to draw, but yeah, okay. that's better. yeah, we can sort of see a little better what you're how you're tackling it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And if I'm doing an animal, I might do several drawings from different angles, though you only have time to do this one now. And it helps you understand the, the structure. So everybody, if you obviously, well, not obviously, but you may not have a deer head to be drawing from, but Michael also mentions that he uses photos a lot. So you can um, find your references in books. You can even, when you get this book, if you get this book either from the library or from your local bookstore, you can try copying the drawings that Michael said in the pages here. And that's a really good way to practice drawing animals is drawing them from either other illustrations or from photographs. But you see how often Michael looks up at that deer. He's drawing, looking up, drawing, looking up. So that's how he's observing every detail. Um, we'll zoom in and have a look at the illustration in just a moment, but he's just putting down the pencil lines. You can sort of see how he's working there. Now I might, if I was drawing this, I might do it again and give myself a little more room to draw the deer. <laughs> his, antlers, his antlers are getting cut off at the top of the page. but uh, You can turn it into a doe. <laughs> <laughs> I would have given a little bit more room. Uh, One of the great nature painters uh, that I love is uh, Audubon. He did oh, yes. drawings uh, of watercolors. I recently went to the New York Historical Society and saw beautiful watercolors that he did before he made his lithographs. And uh, they're just so beautiful. And it was almost like a science to them. That was before the age of photography. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'd love to see that. Where did you see that, Michael? Uh, the New York Historical Society. I, I saw that show before I did Birds Make Nests. So mm -hmm. Wonderful. 
it's really kind of inspiring when you when you see it. And again, it was a, a, the age of uh, before photography that you could just snap. So he had to really work from life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they're just beautiful. The, not only the birds themselves, but the plant life that provides the habitat for them is beautiful. So. Yeah, so our participants obviously are thoroughly enjoying this and hopefully being inspired to draw some animals. As you can see, don't be afraid to just get your pad of paper, just yeah. a pencil. That's how Michael's gotten started. He showed you how he starts his ideas for his picture books. They're all pencil sketches to begin with. So just to get yourself, you know, loosened up, drawing with pencil. And of course, you can erase little things if you're not happy with those, but just keep drawing. Michael's not even using an eraser, of course, because he's so right. good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just uh, share any drawings that you do. Uh, you may not have had time to do a complete drawing this morning, but continue drawing um, when you have time over the weekend and send it in at any time to my email address. Uh, Tim will put that into the chat if you're not familiar with um, where to send that. And do join us always for Saturday Stories when you have time on a Saturday morning, because look how enriching this is. This is such an amazing experience to meet Michael in his beautiful art studio, drawing live, sharing all his behind the scenes, how he creates his amazing picture books. And this will be uploaded on YouTube so that you can revisit this and share also with other uh, folks or family members that missed it this morning and let them know that they can watch Michael and learn all about his fabulous books and especially what he shared this morning, which is his nonfiction series. And the other books, um, Birds and Nests. Is it Birds and Their Nests? Uh, birds Make Nests. Birds Make Nests, that's yeah. right. I'm going to get that book. And, uh, and what a fascinating theme for your new book about how animals survive wildfires. Yes. That is so fascinating. What a great theme. Jessica Sturmer, she's the author. I'm only the illustrator on that one. But I, I was really I was really happy to do that because it was a subject matter I yeah. didn't know much about. Yeah. And the book, uh, her the author's text was very informative. So that that should be out, I think, this fall or maybe the the early spring list of next year. So it's fun. That's why I love the opportunity. That's the great thing because yes. you're learning. And by just doing a quick drawing like this, this is very, uh, very fast. That well, it's gorgeous. and it's it's not very detailed, but I'm learning about the the form of the. And what I also might do. Is, is when I'm drawing something at this stage, I'll I might take the drawing, the the pad up, and I'll do I can just quickly sketch from another angle from right over here. And uh, again, I'm only just roughly doing this, getting this in. But Michael, are you, are you using quite a um a soft pencil? It looks quite yeah, a soft. A, a, a very soft charcoal pencil. I'm, I'm sometimes I don't really use a charcoal pencil that often when I'm uh when I'm doing my illustrations, uh, my pencil sketches for my books, but I wanted this to show up. I wanted to use a charcoal pen. Yes, very good. Show yeah. up a little mm -hmm. more. So again, okay. it's, this is a really rough, rough sketch, but it, it helps you understand when you're looking at it that just by observing, you can learn a lot about your subject. So it's not really meant as a final drawing or a final illustration. It's kind of me exploring the uh, different animals. Yeah. The, the subject. So yeah, like a study. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just in a few seconds, you can uh, you, you you can start to understand the form. Yes. So. Are you going to share anything to do with the digital quickly, or is that something we can um, say in the future? Hmm. Yeah, I I think I would have to do that yes. as a movie, and also. It's kind of time consuming, but one thing yeah. from the digital, you can understand, um, uh, get the idea, if you're not familiar with Photoshop, um, that when I'm doing like a pencil sketch like this, I yeah. might just scan this in and that would be the top layer. This ultimately might not be in the in as part, because it's such a rough drawing that I don't know if you have, how well you can see it. It's a real rough. Can you hold it up for a second? That looks yeah, great. It's very rough. And I really didn't have time to get all the, the shadowing in that I normally would do, and I would normally take more time if this was going to appear in the in the uh, actual illustration. But this is just like a a pre study study, you know. Yes, but, yes, but lovely. When I'm looking at that, I'm seeing how I have a light placed over here, and seeing how the light kind of shadows off, uh, creates a shadow and a highlight, 
over there. And so I'm I'm learning about the form as a, as I do it. Um, yeah. But in in a file, like in in the book I did for the Getty Museum, the pencil sketches appear. I did a technique where uh, um, I drew with a charcoal pencil on rough paper, and then yeah. I did kind of what would look like a watercolor te technique over it, and mm -hmm. uh, so it gives it a very sketchbooky feel. Which uh, I did photographs of Lewis Hind. I worked. I did illustrations of Lewis Hind, and the, all the artwork also included his photographs, the anti-child uh, labor photographs in them, which was uh, a, a very nice. So I do something different every time. I just, I wanna have fun while I do it. And um, I don't wanna utilize, some, sometimes you can really see me drawing, the drawing as part of the illustration, other times not. That uh, yeah. like I'll, in layers, I might have a sketch over from one of my sketchbooks. Uh, I, I might have this sketch as the top layer of a book. These are sketches from a book I recently did. So that might appear in the very top layer and then I draw each one of those shapes underneath it. The, uh, the, 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 the skin might be uh, on one layer, the hair on another layer, the eyes on another layer, the, the boy's shirt on another layer, his legs and hands on another layer. And then you can move them all around. And if, if it turns out you need more room for type or you drew his head too big, you can reduce it in size and it gives you the flexibility. And, some, and sometimes an art director would say, even after everybody see, as so they, they've seen the original sketches that you submitted, they wouldn't, can't you turn his head this way a little bit more? And if you've done a whole oil painting, which I used to do, that's a lot of work to redo that, you have to paint that out. Or in a watercolor, you can't do it. You have to paint the whole picture over again. Absolutely, so, true, true. Um, so I'm gonna segue into asking you, um, did you teach yourself digital or did you take some courses? Because when I, you went to Pratt, you didn't, no, it no, hadn't been invented yet. And it's hard to, it's hard to believe, uh, it's hard to understand how revolutionary that was. That, mm -hmm. um, But it turned out, when I first started to do it, I could see the, the possibilities of it. And uh, it, then it soon, the art directors soon became aware it was much easier for them to work with you. Like normally when I did an oil painting, that had to be sent out to be scanned. And sometimes the scan wasn't right or a photograph then scanned. And there was a whole other... Uh, a other layer of work and that things could go wrong and and when you when you work digitally you sent them originally a whole big pile of what, what looked like eight track tapes that to do to do a whole picture book and it was expensive but but they returned them afterwards but the thing is then it went right into their layout and they could see there wasn't all this extra they put your their your disc into their computer and pop your picture into their layout and uh it was much easier for them to work and make changes. And uh, there's usually, it's not just one person. It, it couldn't be, it could be somebody in the sales force say, wouldn't it be nicer if the sky was bright blue or something? And that's just politics and you have to deal with it. And it's not the art director's fault or the editor's fault. It's just the the uh, whole organization. Of, it's a collaborative effort. And sometimes that person yeah. in the sales, the sales division, they're very important. They overrule everybody. So you have to make everybody happy and it gives you flexibility. And sometimes making the sky bright blue is better. It is better that so you so sometimes you hadn't thought of something and somebody else did think of it and it turns out it's right. So it's much easier to work. Uh, and it's I find it more creative than working. There's certain limitations in working with traditional material, which I still like to do. So um it's and earlier, Michael was saying, you know, to be in the picture book industry as an illustrator, especially as an illustrator, uh, you do have to be open to collaboration. You have to be patient. <laughs> Two things that he recommends, because, yes, once you've got your book at a publishing house, there is an art directing team and there's the editing team, and they're all looking to make the most beautiful book and yes. they'll have input. Of course, the illustrator can have some feedback. They may not always agree, but they may have to try these things. And there's a little bit of going back and forth to get the book just just right. I'm sure, Michael, it's very minimal now because you've done so many. They just trust you to <laughs> yes. do fabulous books. But we well, look yeah. some more books from you. That's always um, so so exciting because you do so many different ones. So well, thank you, thank you. I always have ones in the work. And well, thank you for hosting me here. Yes. It's been an absolute pleasure, Michael. And we would love to have you since you're not too far from the city. You could come to the Society of Illustrators and do an in-person 
workshop and event with a picture book uh, perhaps next year. So, I, would, I would love to do that. I'd be happy to do that. Yes. So look out for that, um, everybody. We will be, as I said, uploading this a video so you can revisit it and just and pour over it a little bit more at your own pace. And thank you for spending your morning with us, Michael. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to see you in your studio, hear all about how you create these gorgeous books. And well, it's very inspiring to learn more about unusual animals. Um, I would certainly love this book. And it was it's a treat to have you read it. You know, I've read it to myself. I haven't yet read it to mm -hmm. um, uh, children, but I've read it to myself a few times and I really loved hearing you read it. So thank you for sharing that. Well, with thank, me. thank you for having me. It was our pleasure. The society really enjoys having you here anytime. So um, we've got thank you from everybody. Wonderful. And particularly loving these nature books. I agree. It was really wonderful to see them this morning. Uh, so lots of thank yous from our audience. And uh, we thank you for coming and joining us. Participants, join us again. And then everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Michael. I look forward to seeing you. Thank you, Claire. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.